historical comments. The first thing is that the racing torsion in the context was introduced by William Singer, but just as an analog, as an analog of real torsion and as an analog in the context of the Ram theory. That is, I just developed the formalism in the context of the Ram theory. I mean, there is a well-known theory of the Ram, of the Ram torsion connected with Riemann torsion, and I just developed this as an analog, but certainly without any connection with Riemann-Hoch or with the index. I mean, with the index theory algebraic geometry. I asked this explicitly to Singer. He confirmed this at the time. He had absolutely no view of seeing racing with torsion as being an element of any Riemann-Hoch theorem. The second thing is that Quillen introduced the Quillen matrix, introduced Quillen matrix, but in the context of Riemann surfaces, when X is a Riemann surface, and he proved the curvature theorem, in the case where you have a fixed Riemann surface, so X is fixed, and the moduli here is simply a moduli of vector bundles, even probably of line bundles. So moduli of holomorphic vector bundles. So, of course, then what this theorem does is extend is, is extend this to arbitrary relative di dimension. So the third thing I would like to say is that this theorem basically is misquoted, often misused, and probably used also in the wrong way. We are checking the, the proper hypothesis. We say in particular that you have this locally, locally scalar condition, and the fact that the matrix GTX has to be fiberwise scalar. I mean, the problem in this is that you don't see any of these either on the left-hand side, which is defined in terms of Quillen matrix, which have a natural algebraic definition, nor on the right hand side, where the Kähler condition does not appear. So actually, the Kähler condition appears in the equal sign. So, in other words, without any of these assumptions, the theorem is certainly wrong. So, the theorem has been misused, and there is an interesting story for this misuse is that I explained to you at some point in the finite dimensional case. Transgression formulas in the Bottschern context, that is, involving just the Debar D operator. Transgression as an extension of Chern Simon's transgression. But in the context of Chern Simon's transgression, in the smooth category, this is the work that I had done with Fried. In the context of smooth C infinity determinant bundles, which is actually one ingredient in the proof of this in the general holomorphic case, but just one ingredient. So people got mixed up, and eventually I would say that most of the time, including in the strictly mathematics literature, the theorem has been misquoted. So let me now move to applications of the theory of coulometrics. So here I just skip question of embeddings, search of T, so on, and okay. So applications, I will review first of all the case of the moduli space of elliptic curves. 
This case is just an example. That is, we will not learn anything about elliptic curves, but we will see how analytic torsion can be used to produce effectively a modular form of the space X of one of elliptic curves. So, let me call X of one again the moduli space of elliptic curves, the curves of genus one. Then you can represent as the quotient of the H to be the upper half plane by the action of SL2Z. So, if you give yourself, uh, let me just now be a little bit more precise, if you give yourself tau to be an element of the upper half plane, I introduce a quotient C tau of C by uh, the lattice, which is generated by one and tau. So R tau is just a lattice A plus B tau, and C tau is just a torus that you obtain by quotienting C by R tau. So let me call uh, DZ the holomorphic differential in the C of the complex plane so that R tau, this lattice, becomes the period lattice. So if you take dz bar, this gives you a, a local. <coughs> I, I will essentially work on the open set inside of x of 1. I would avoid the boundary of x of 1. So dz bar is a local holomorphic section of H01 of C tau, this coefficient in C. So you view this dz bar as, again, over the space of tau. Now, what I'm saying is that the curve C tau for tau fixed carries a canonical flat metric with volume 1. So that's the metric GC divided by I of tau. The canonical flat metric with volume 1. Let me also point out that on the space of anti-holomorphic differentials or holomorphic differentials, we have a canonical norm, L2 norm, which is obtained by integrating over C tau the form dz bar wedge dz, and essentially what you get is that the norm of dz bar square is given by 2 i of tau. So now we're going to consider the Quillen matrix on a lifted curve. So that, what this means is that I will look at the direct image of the trivial sheaf by the projection from the moduli space of curves to the base in top. So I call lambda to be the determinant of the direct image, r by star of O C. So again, we equip the tangent bundle T C tau with its canonical metric. And what I'm saying is that if you apply the curvature theorem for equivalent metrics, what you get is that the curvature vanishes. So let's try to explain this. Is equal to zero. So why is that? Because if you use, okay, so we have to verify, again, the conditions that I said, locally Kayla, I mean, the projection has to be locally Kayla, and the metric has to be fiber-wise Kayla. In this case, it's obvious the metric is Kayla because, I mean, it's a constant metric on a Riemann surface. So it's Kayla, and the condition that it's, that it's locally Kayla is easy to verify. So let me show this. So 
I use the curvature theorem. I'm just saying that this is pi star of the Todd of Tc tau equipped with its metric and the piece of degree 2. But however, in this case, the tangent bundle to the fiber is just okay, it's just a lift, it's just a lift of a vector bundle on the base. on the base x of 1. Okay, what this means is that the tangent bundle is fiberwise trivial. So in other words, this Todd, this Todd form is a lift of the form on the base. If you integrate the lift of the form along the fiber, you get 0. Okay, so what this says is that the bundle lambda Equipped is flat. And so what this ultimately says is that inside on the open set, inside is of one open, I just work for the moment, on the open set, you can trivialize, you can identify canonically lambda, <coughs> lambda with a trivial bundle C equipped with its canonical metric. Okay, so what are the consequences of this? So I'm saying the coolant metric for the moment is, is defined on x of 1 of the complement of the singular set, in particular the complement of the curves, of the curves. So, the first thing I will do is compute the C1. I will compute the C1 of the determinant of R pi star C equipped with its L2 metric. In this case, I allow myself to speak about the L2 metric because the cohomology of this C2 is very simple. And if I just do this, I mean, you know that H01 of C2 is generated by the DZ bar. So if you compute the C1 form, it's not a C1 class, but it's the C1 form of this H01 of C2, what you get is minus up to sign, oh, so, oh sorry, there is no minus here, you get the canonical value form on the upper half plane. Uh, sorry, I have a question. I don't know, maybe I misunderstood you, but uh, th this flat uh, bundle a priori might have non-trivial uh, um, monodromy? Around, sorry? It, um, could the, this flat bundle have non-trivial monodromy around the singular point? For the moment we just work outside of the singular point. Okay, so we work, okay. But when you claim that there is this canonical isomorphism... You inside, mean, inside. I mean, for a fixed curve. I mean, you need to fix something, right? I mean, you have a choice to make. So that's why the identification eventually with modular form will be made up to a constant. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Okay, so, so this is up to a is, constant. Yeah, so this... Yeah. Okay, so <coughs> what I'm saying is that the C1 of the cohomology of the fiber in degree 1 which is generated by DC bar, so you know what the norm is, you compute the C1 form, and what you get is the canonical value form on the upper half plane, which I wrote here as dx prime dy prime divided by y prime square, that the canonical hyperbolic volume form. So analytic torsion is the Kähler potential. So, I remind you that you have the formula which says that C1 of lambda equipped with its Quillen metric lambda is equal to C1 of the determinant of the direct image equipped with the L2 metric minus d bar d of analytic torsion. So in this case, the C1 of lambda equipped with its L2 metric 
The function 1, degree 0, there is no contribution. So what you get is just minus C1 of A01 of C tau. That's a consequence of a curvature equation. And so what you get finally is that because this C1 vanishes, this is one form, what you find is that the analytic torsion, so analytic torsion is a, is a function now on the base. It is the analytic torsion of the curve C tau. It provides you with a Kähler potential for the canonical volume form. So it's a Kähler potential for minus the canonical volume form on x of 1. So, let me again say that <laughs> equivalently, if you like, I reformulated the flatness as saying the log of dz bar minus 1 squared with respect to the Quillen metric is a harmonic function on x of 1. So, analytic torsion and the delicate eta function. So this is where now we're going to relate the analytic torsion to modular forms. So let me remind you that we have the delicate eta function, which is defined on the upper half plane, which is given by this, this formula here, in terms of Q. Q is the the e to the 2 pi pi tau, and that's given by this infinite product formula. It is a modular form of weight one half and the discrim discriminant delta. The discriminant delta is an invariant of the elliptic curve. It is given by 2 pi to the 12th eta to the 24. So, what is the relation between analytic torsion and the Dedekind eta function? Okay, so what Ray and Singer proved in their paper introducing holomorphic torsion is exactly this that the Quillen norm of the section dz bar minus 1 of the determinant line bundle is essentially up to a constant. The norm square of the dedicated eta function. <coughs> so this was proved in the original racing a paper by simply working out explicitly the spectrum of the Laplacian on the elliptic curve and computing ultimately the racing torsion. To do this computation, they actually used the Kronecker limit formula. So let me just mention that eta square is a modular form of weight one. So let me just explain how this result of Ray and Singer can be proved directly using the theory of analytic torsion and what is known about Quillen metrics. The reason why I insist on this is that this result of Ray and Singer will be eventually extended to other moduli spaces where actually analytic torsion will in many cases also produce modular invariants on higher dimensional moduli spaces. So let me just explain this. So again, the log of dz bar minus 1 square is harmonic. If x of 1 was compact, this would imply that this function is, is constant. However, as we know, there are two singular points in x of 1 and there is the cusp. 
in X of 1. And basically, the identification of the section dz bar minus 1 of k to the minus 1 half. k is the canonical bundle. k minus 1 half is just the square root to the minus 1 half on x of 1. The proof eventually consists in showing that dz bar minus 1 has the same divisor as eta squared. So basically, on this space x of 1, which eventually can be properly compactified at infinity, you get two sections of the same line bundle. And basically, to identify them up to constant, what you only need to do is control analytic torsion at the boundary. And if you want, but of course, that's a much to trivial case here, the proper control of analytic torsion at the boundary can be done using the embedding formula. So let me just clarify again what I did. So what we know by the sort of argument I explained before, by saying that the line bundle lambda could be trivialized, we already know that this is the module square of a certain holomorphic function f, f of tau. This is what the flatness of the Quillen metric tells you. That's a consequence of the flatness of the Quillen metric where f is holomorphic. What I've done here is identify this function with dedicated eta function. And actually, in some sense, the identification was done by saying basically these two functions, eta and dz bar, have the same singularity at the cusp. OK. so. Now, let me move to a more complicated case, the case of case 3 surfaces. I will here follow the Yoshika law. So let me remind you that the case 3 surface is simply connected with trivial canonical bundle. And the case 3 surface is then Kalabiya. So you have a lot of Ricci flat metrics on K3 surface. So, what I'm saying is that if you equip a K3 surface with a Calabi Yao metric, the determinant line of X equipped with a trivial sheaf is trivial, and the Quillen metric is also trivial. So, you cannot extract any information a priori from a moduli space of K3 surfaces. Actually, this is a simple consequence of Serre duality. Serre duality tells you already that lambda is trivial, and besides, by combining this with Kalei-Yau metric, you can prove that the Quillen metric is also trivial. Actually, this story of K3 surfaces is complicated because at some point there were papers circulated claiming that the moduli space of K3 surfaces produced modular forms. But of course, the modular form was the modular form zero. So, what Yoshikawa does is that he considers the moduli space of K3 surfaces with an antisymplectic involution. So you have an evolution i, and you assume that i star of eta, where eta is a canonical section of the is, is, is a section of the canonical bundle, is equal to minus eta. So, 
What he does is that he does not consider analytic notion, but he replaces this by equivariant analytic torsion. So you have a version of analytic torsion in which the action of a group element, like the involution, is involved. Okay, so in other words, every time you have traces, you introduce the involution. And in this case, you also have to look at the properly defined equivariant determinant. This is a very mild modification of the constructions I gave, where you introduce the involution at every stage. And so, in some sense, by exactly the same methods as before, he constructs a holomorphic section of lambda y. Lambda y is not the determinant of the cohomology. It is a determinant of the cohomology properly taking into account the action of the evolution and also the fixed point set of the evolution. So in this case, with K3 equipped with an antisymplectic evolution, you can also describe what are the fixed point sets. So you need to do a more complicated construction. But ultimately, what you obtain is a holomorphic section of this determinant line lambda y, lambda index y, of the open the regular set of the moduli space. So, this construction in principle involves the Calabi Yao method. But what he realized is that actually the Calabi Yao metric is not needed to produce this sort of invariance, and basically uh, using the anomaly formulas, these generalized anomaly formulas for analytic torsion that I proved in some other, some other paper, you can actually use any sort of Kähler metric to construct this holomorphic section of the line bundle lambda r. So, there is a question of knowing what is this holomorphic section? What is it? So, in this case, what analytic torsion gives you, in some sense, exactly like in the case of modular curves, instead of producing the dedicated eta function, what you get is a Boschert modular form. In some sense, the technique consists exactly as doing exactly what I suggested in the case of elliptic curves, that is showing these are two sections of some line bundle which do have the same divisor. The divisor of a Boschert modular form is complicated, so, I mean, you do not have at all this simplicity that happens in the case of X of 1. There would be actually several candidates. I mean, in the case of elliptic curves, basically, the line bundle that you look at, the dimension of its holomorphic sections is 1. In the case of this Yoshikawa moduli space, it's much bigger. So, ultimately, you identify this section as being a Borchert modular form, in particular, by expanding analytic torsion at one very precise singular point on the boundary of the moduli space, and the expansion itself of Bochert modular form as itself a great interest. I don't understand what this statement is supposed to be. Sorry? The, 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 the sections on the moduli space of K3, right? Yes, yes. And Borchert's is a function where? On the moduli, it's on the moduli space of these K3 surfaces with anticipatic involution. Okay, so we exactly have the analog of X of 1. In the case of elliptic curves, you have the moduli space X of 1, and you obtain the eta function as a section of some 
line of angle, in that case, you have the modelized space of case free surface with some can canonical symplectic involution. And basically, you identify analytic torsion as being one very precise section, which is given by Borchardt's modular form. I would have thought that the moduli space of K3 was, with involution was bigger than the moduli space of well. No, it is just, I mean, okay. you know, it selects precisely this one. Let me give a third example, which is the BCOV analytic torsion. So let me take X to be a Halibi Yao, and I introduce as a twisting bundle, again, the sum of minus 1 to the i times i times the exterior algebra of the holomorphic pretension bundle. So, what I'm saying is that these BCOV, Berchatsky, Tchaikovsky, etc., Oguri and Waffa torsion, appears in the formulation of mirror symmetry. Let me just make a remark here. Is that if you have deleted the i in this direct sum, you would get something trivial. Okay, so if you took minus 1 to the i, lambda i, t star of x, the holomorphic torsion of this would be trivial. So in some sense, <laughs> you reintroduce these weights, minus 1 to the i times i, to destroy the triviality in the properties of this analytic torsion. So BCOV torsion appears in the formulation of mirror symmetry. So there are many questions involving BCOV torsion. Again, in the paper of uh, Berchatsky and so on, you know that the coefficients of the expansion of this BCOV torsion at some special point on the moduli space of the considered Calabi Yao, these coefficients appear in the, in, the, in the mirror image as being connected with uh, counting numbers, drum of which are invariants. But mathematically speaking, the question which has arisen recently is a question of birational invariance. Is BCOV torsion a birational invariant of the considered Calabi Yao manifold? Okay, so I listed here some applications. So, more generally, every time that you have a modulized space, in some sense, I would say the typical example of Calabi Yao, but not only, by computing analytic torsion of the fiber, you produce a function of the moduli space, and this function detects certain invariants of the moduli space, in particular, in certain cases, modular forms. Let me insist on the fact that even though Calabi Yao metrics are useful, they are not needed to compute this invariance, this invariance, simply because <coughs> using the anomaly formulas, the generalized anomaly formulas, any Kähler metric <coughs> is as good to compute this sort of invariance. So there is absolutely no need to study degeneration of Calabi Yau metrics on the boundary spaces of such objects. So, I now give a few references in the course. These are the two foundational papers by Quillen. These are the papers by myself, Gilles Soulet and Le Beau. This is a review paper by Bost. This is the arithmetic Riemann-Roch theorem of Gilles and Soulet. And here is a paper by Berchatsky, Tchaikovsky, etc. 
So this is a review paper, which I think is still useful, which is contained a lot of the things that are reviewed in this course. And these are more recent papers on on uh, analytic function of riemann roch theorem in a of geometry. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions. Can you see which statements should we uh, look out for? Like, uh, do, you, do you object to the statement that, you know, the curvature of the determinant line bundle is the Kähler form on the modulus? Yes. I mean, you know, again, that's a starting point. Because without this, I mean, if you don't have a compatibility at some point yeah. with riemann roch formula, you do not, you cannot start. Mm -hmm. But at that point, what you realize is that analytic torsion provides you with something which is secondary with respect to that. It says the difference of the two, of, I mean, it ultimately, in the context of moduli spaces, it provides you essentially with a Kähler potential, with respect to some, and then it gives you a candidate to produce some canonical function on the moduli space that you look at, whose expansion at some critical point, at some point at infinity, as you know, the expansion itself has a very, is is of considerable importance. So analytic torsion, in some sense, on one hand, gives you a function, and specializing it to a specific point, in principle, connects you with, I mean, may help you to understand mirror symmetry. So paradoxically enough, I mean, the behavior of analytic torsion in the case of BCOV torsion, in some sense, mirror symmetry which at that level is still not proved, allow you to anticipate the behavior of colored metrics at infinity before even the proof was obtained. That is, you could use a mirror side to get the expansion at this special point of ultimately analytic torsion and deduce the result in advance that eventually was proved using the theory of colored metrics. So since mirror symmetry at that level is not proved, what I'm saying is not a proof. But it's just a hint of how mirror symmetry can be used to anticipate results. On the other side, in the case of on color metrics. Uh, this is for a naive question, but uh, do you expect to get anything non-trivial for abelian varieties? Like sorry, sorry? For abelian varieties. Well, for abelian varieties, analytic torsion essentially in high dimensions is trivial. So, so no, it doesn't give you anything. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. can't do anything with no, the no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, it gives you something in the equivalent case. That is, if you ta start taking into account the action of, in the, of uh, group element and so on, no, then it gives you uh, information. But a priori, analytic torsion itself, trivial. There is nothing. In dimension bigger than one. In this other paper, an analytic torsion is corresponding to the genus 1 uh, B model correct yes, yes. Uh, Is that your identical high genus? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, in this paper BCOV, there is a whole theory also for the, 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 the anomaly formula and so on, where the coefficients yeah. of the expansion of the analytic torsion would serve as determining yeah. some equation. The, the, yes, yes, but I mean, this is the theory of Kuhlman metrics does not give you a hint on anything on mirror symmetry. It just provides you with this, with this function, it analyzes it, it can give you more precise information. But going to the other side, no. So it's probable that you will have two functions which have the same sort of properties and you eventually can identify them because there is only one of its kind. So the example that I gave in the case of dedicating it a function or of Borchert's modular form is an example of this. We have some function, which is analytic torsion. It has some divisor, and another object that you know as the same divisor. So eventually, they can be identified. So I have a question. I, I don't know whether this is a 
consequence of what you have been saying. But uh, in the case of the um, index theorem for families, if you suppose if you take a family women surfaces that eventually become nodal. Yes. And assume that the, the total space is smooth and that, that you have a, a just an ordinary holomorphic vector bundle. Can you say something about the behavior? Of course. Uh, yes. Yes. That's, the singular that, that's, that's very simple. This is the point I said about the question of using the valid formula as being used to compute any sort of degeneration. Okay. Simply because you take the space of degeneration, mm -hmm. you take the projection, and you write it as the product of the embedding and of the embedding in the product space and the projection on the base. The embedding formula gives you a formula relating the kilometric on this smooth but degenerating, uh, let's say, Riemann surface to the kilometric on the total space. The normalization of the Riemann surface. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the projection also allows you to prolong. So ultimately, you know everything. Because even though the fibers degenerate, mm -hmm. the total space remains smooth. Yeah. And so all the degeneration is controlled by the embedding formula. And can you relate a posteriori what you obtain with the Laplacian on the normalization? I mean, it's yes, yes. So there are results of this kind, which tells you, I mean, it depends on the sort of metric that you're interested in. Yeah. Either you take the metric which makes it the thing very, very long with cylinders, or you take the embedded metric. Yeah. Okay. Let me just take the case of the embedded metric. In this case, what you know, I mean, so, is that you have a logarithmic degeneration. I mean, logarithmic, the met color metric is not smooth. It has a logarithmic singularity mm -hmm. at the degeneration log locus. Mm -hmm. This logarithmic singularity is compatible with Riemann-Hoff Rotendieck as it should be, because basically it tells you that the C1 of the Coulomb metric is now given by a smooth part plus a Dirac mass part. Mm -hmm. Okay, concentrated at the generating point, but there is more than that. If you look at the Coulomb metric and move to the singular one, and you subtract the logarithmic singularity, in this case, what you find is a Coulomb metric on the normalization, okay, with a contribution of the coincidence. In other words, if you, if you are in the high dimension, because that would be clear, you would find the Cullen metric on the normalization and the Cullen metric on the intersection, combining, all of them combining to say the renormalized limit of the Cullen metric after extraction of the singularity is given by a combination of these two metrics. Yeah. Any other question? So maybe, maybe I'll make a remark. So there is a way of uh, understanding the metrics that uh, uh, Martin uh, called the autometrics in his talk uh, for line bundles on general Riemann surface energies using this technology. So th there is this uh, work that I did with um, uh, Dennis Erickson. It's not a yes. in physics. So the yeah, it's not it's not just just a direct formula, but yeah, there's a way of uh, using it just Coulomb metrics and determinants, something called the uh, so the link uh, pairings that uh, that gives you yeah a prequantization of the the color structure that Martin was talking about. Yeah, I mean, in some point you work with the Coulomb metric, but actually there are many cases where you're interested in the L2 metric for good reason. And so what you want to show is that the Quillen metric, yeah, in some right. sense, is small with respect to the L2 metric. This is in particular true in the asymptotic case. I mean, if you want to get a Hilbert Samuel sort of theorem, where you prove actually that the contribution of analytical and certain conditions with the tensor line positive line bundle make P tend to infinity is small. This you can do. And so ultimately what you get, the main contribution is the comes from the L2 metric. So I mean, all, the, all of these use, I mean, depends on the sort of problem that you want to look at. But let me insist again on the fact that even though using calabi yau metrics, when you have a calabi yau metric, can be good. I mean, calabi yau metrics, in some sense, are hard to understand under degeneration. I mean, you do not want, if you start looking at the question of degeneration of calabi yau metric, that's a complicated question. 
there is no need to do that because you can use any other metric, any other scalar metric is as good as scalar Biao. Actually, the defect can be controlled by a local formula and this local quantity does not even necessitate the fact that you know there is a Calabi-Yau metric. So ultimately, Calabi-Yau metrics are just useless in this context. The only point is that if you take the Calabi-Yau metric, you don't have a local defect to compensate for the lack of closeness or d bar d closeness and so on. But you do not need ultimately to use Calabi-Yau metric or any sort of canonical metric because you know how Quillen metrics vary locally under deformation in the Kähler class. Yeah, maybe I just wanted to make one comment. Uh, it's not exactly related to your lecture, but it's close. And but. So I never mentioned like the numerical invariance related to these field theories I was talking about. And there's like a very famous theorem of like uh, Tobbs that basically like the cyber witten invariance is like the Reitermeister torsion. And that is like actually like the simplest, also the simplest example of 3D mirror symmetry uh, where uh, you're computing like on the A side, that's the cyber witten invariant and the B side is naturally like the Reitermeister torsion. Reimerser torsion or holomorphic torsion? Uh, the Reitermeister torsion. Oh. So, so that's why I said oh, it's not... Right. Reimerser is another theory. I mean, in some sense... Yeah, I know. I said it was like somewhat close, but not... not yeah, I know it's not the same, but I just thought it was very Yes, basic. yeah. So, so of course, Reimerser torsion... I mean, there is some... Actually, at the deep level, all these torsions are the same, but... I mean, but that's a very deep level. Yeah, but they, they use the analytic torsion, like in the, like in yeah. the construction. Uh, there's a paper of like Mikhailov. Yeah. Uh, anyway. I just wanted to tie. Good <coughs> again.